National Petroleum Council report uh, WebEx, which USDA is uh, honored to uh, assist in. I, I, I am Sheila Hollis. I'm the acting executive director of USDA. Uh, just a moment on that, but uh, uh, and I've had a long time in the uh, energy business. Uh, but uh, I'm here uh, as a result of a, of a tragedy, and that is the very uh, untimely uh, and uh, uh, shocking uh, a departure of our dear friend uh, and uh, and known to all of you, uh, Barry Worthington, who passed away suddenly uh, in August. So we have uh, continued uh, to follow in, in Barry's footsteps and in what we know would be his wishes is to continue to be deeply and profoundly involved in the efforts going forward. And uh, uh, I know that many of you knew uh, Barry very, very well. And uh, let me say that uh, we uh, carry on and soldier on in, in his spirit. So with that, uh, I want to thank um, the wonderful USEA team that have, has been so supportive, including today with respect to all the multiple uh, uh, platforms that we are now utilizing. And I also uh, wish to thank uh, James Slutes, uh, who has worked so hard in pulling this together too. And thank you, thank you so much, Jim. Uh, you've done an enormous amount of effort, and it's been uh, wonderful working with you. Well, just a, a few brief brief moments. Um, we all know that uh, natural gas systems um, and assumptions uh, uh, that we uh, grew up with, perhaps in the oil and gas business. Uh, are long gone. We live in a changed world thanks uh, to the last, uh, thank God, 10 years of energy abundance uh, as a result of uh, technology developments and opportunities which uh, had uh, uh, lay fallow for, for many decades. And uh, now we have gone from the uh, unfortunate position, position of being an importer to being an exporter. Uh, and uh, we expect that that role in the world will continue to grow. Uh, uh, we have uh, complexities, difficulties with respect to uh, all of the environmental issues. That's the nature of the beast in such an enormous uh, industry. Uh, but at the same time, the country is uh, desperately in need of the energy supply, uh, which is discussed and studied uh, and uh, analyzed so well in the NPC uh, dynamic delivery studies. Uh, we are uh, delighted to have with us this morning, and because time is short, I will uh, abbreviate uh, the bios of the wonderful people that we have speaking, and I'm just going to address the first two. Uh, that is uh, Amy, Amy Shank, uh, who is Director of Pipeline Integrity at Williams. Uh, and uh, she is in uh, the current responsibilities and uh, she heads up the regulatory compliance as well as pipeline integrity and pipeline risk. So we know that you are uh, prepared uh, to discuss some of the um, in intensely uh, complex uh, and uh, often contentious issues with respect to how to make it all work better, how to get more uh, engagement, how to get uh, people involved and understand and realize that uh, natural gas supply and natural gas uh, integrity of their systems to get that gas to market and to be utilized and also to be exported to uh, countries around the world uh, that seek also to have a clean burning uh, source of fuel to uh, basically uh, to uh, aid in just about everything in the, in the powering up of their economies and the support uh, and decency of human life in those countries to provide uh, the energy supply that they need to to make them go. Uh, and we also have uh, our Deputy Assistant Secretary for Oil and Gas at USDOE, Sean Bennett, a uh, delightful person I've been speaking to and have seen him speak a number of times in the past. Uh, he, he is in charge of the administration of oil and gas programs, including research and development analysis and natural gas regulation. Uh, and uh, natural gas regulation in and of itself would keep you busy all the time. So uh, he has more than a decade of experience in uh, public affairs, government relations, and uh, he served as the executive VP of the Ohio Oil and Gas Association, OOGA. So it's a pleasure to have you both on board. Uh, and with that, I will turn it back over uh, to Andrew uh, and also 
uh, go forth, James, if you wish to chime in before we leap into the presentations. In the interest of time, obviously, everyone's biographies are much more extensive uh, and extraordinary, and we are delighted and honored to have them with us today and to uh, support and encourage the NPC uh, in its studies and efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. And Sean, just before you jump in, um, I'd like to make a few procedural notes for everybody. Um, uh, we will be uh, having a, an open discussion format today, um, so we, we encourage you uh, please to submit your uh, questions uh, through the Q&A or through the chat uh, on WebEx, and uh, we'll, we'll get to the questions um, following the panel discussion as outlined in the agenda. So um, with that, I'd uh, like to turn things over, and uh, Sheila's already given a wonderful introduction. So uh, Sean Bennett, please, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Oil and Natural Gas for the U.S. Department of Energy. The floor is yours. Thank you, Sean. Oh, thank you, Andrew, and uh, thank you, Sheila, for, the, for those kind remarks. I, I think I need to record those and just use that as my introdu introductory remarks everywhere I go. Uh, but, uh, uh, th and again, thank you for, for stepping a, a, into the role uh, for Barry with his untimely passing. And really want to thank uh, USEA for, for hosting this webinar. Uh, as Sheila mentioned, I'm the Deputy Secretary for the Office of Oil and Natural Gas here at the Department of Energy. Um, so, you know, not only do we look at the research and development to ensure that we continue to be uh, a, a leader in oil and gas development here in the United States, but also the regulatory function for natural gas, whether it's imports or exports, which have become increasingly uh, more uh, more popular with uh, the uh, LNG uh, that we are really uh, changing the world on. And it's a really fascinating experience that I've had here at the Department of Energy. Uh, I remember um, really the week of, of Barry's passing, we actually held a quick conference call regarding uh, this event and uh, you know Barry was such a great man and you know really transformed you know the the USEA from a kind of modest nonprofit to a you know an essential force in, in energy education policy innovation that it is today and uh, he will be will be greatly missed and really want to offer our sincere condolences to his family and colleagues um, but uh, Sheila, you're, you're doing a wonderful job, and, and, and God bless you for the work that you're doing. And, uh, you know, DOE has always been a, a great supporter of USEA, and, and uh, they just do great work, and, and you guys are, are doing a phenomenal job. And I really want to thank also the, the National Petroleum Council uh, for, you know, working through, uh, you know, the outreach during these difficult times. Uh, you know, COVID definitely uh, through a wrench in a lot of our in-person meetings, and uh, you know, it, uh, it it has really transformed into a lot of these webinars. So uh, it, it's it's really been an experience here. And uh, Amy uh, Shank from Williams Company for for her leadership, and 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 it's just been phenomenal to work with through this. I think we were at 18 or 19 months of the process. Uh, Paul McNutt, uh, Brooke Harris uh, from Exxon Mobil, uh, Jay uh, Churchill, Maria Don, and Doug Sauer, who's also here for their leadership on the study effort. Uh, you know, it was uh, definitely an experience of a lifetime, and um, I don't think any of us are excited to do it again anytime soon, uh, but we all probably will want to do it in the future because it is a, a lot of work, but uh, really uh, just an amazing process itself. And really, uh, you know, it wasn't just the, the, the leadership of the study effort, but really the, the broader study team. You know, there are so many organizations that participated uh, in the study. Uh, and their contributions to this report over two years um, really, really made this into what it was today. And it was, you know, the diversity of companies and organizations that were engaged in the study really enriched the findings and recommendations. And, and, and really, you know, the Department of Energy is truly pleased uh, to receive uh, these insights from such a, a wide range of stakeholders. Now, the National Petroleum Council, for, for those of you who are are not aware, um, you know, was established back in 1946 by President Truman and is a federally chartered uh, advisory committee whose purpose is to advise, inform, and make recommendations to the Secretary of Energy on all matters uh, related to oil and natural gas. Uh, with over uh, 200 members, the, the MPC is really a, a, a well-balanced representation from all segments of the industry, including interests outside of the oil and gas uh, operations such as representatives from academia, uh, financial research, Native American groups, and public interest organizations and institutions. Now, this study really goes back to September of 2017. Uh, at that time, uh, Secretary Perry 
uh, and the department, we're really looking for the council's perspective on the present and future state of the U.S. oil and natural gas transportation infrastructure. And this really goes back to, you know, uh, Secretary Perry's uh, active role as, as governor in the great state of Texas and, and really, you know, being the, at the forefront of oil and gas. And, you know, trying to see, you know, what does the current state of affairs look like as well as what does the future of oil and gas? Because at the end of the day, without infrastructure, all the production that we see in the United States doesn't matter. Um, so we have to make sure that it gets to markets. And that is really, you know, the importance of infrastructure. And infrastructure really is all-encompassing. You think about it, it's not just pipelines, but it's rail, it's, it's marine, uh, it's trucks. And, 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 you know, how do we get all of this product to market, whether it's oil, natural gas, or or refined products. So really the growth in, in oil and natural gas in the United States has really been a game changer, not just for economic growth, but really has provided us with greater energy security. And to further advance this, you know, the United States must continue producing all of its energy resources. And we all recognize that from fossil fuels uh, to sources like nuclear, uh, hydro, wind, solar, we need all of these energy sources to really come together and, and be sure that we maintain uh, our, our energy security. And this re will require new investment in energy infrastructure because without this infrastructure, the potential to realize the full economic benefits of our resources and true energy se security is, is really truly unrealized. Now, as I mentioned earlier, uh, COVID has kind of changed the way that we are rolling out this study. Uh, and really, the, the, the COVID pandemic, um, you know, we, we went through a lot of scenarios uh, when we were going through supply and demand uh, in regard to the study. And uh, I, I'll tell you, uh, we did not anticipate COVID, um, but it has definitely introduced a, a degree of uncertainty uh, that the industry and the, and the world is, is facing currently here today. Now, all the, although the, the timing and the path to recovery uh, from the pandemic, you know, remains uncertain. Uh, it, the truth is oil and gas industry can and will play a really a central role in preparing, uh, I'm sorry, in propelling the recovery forward. So looking forward, um, what we'll need from, what will be needed from the oil and gas sector uh, to thrive beyond this time of disruption and uncertainty, the findings and recommendation from the study provides the insights for policymakers, business leaders, uh, to really consider and act upon uh, to support the return to prosperity. So the study does uh, recognize that there are certain regulatory barriers uh, to technology adoption in the midstream oil and gas sector, and these must be addressed uh, by federal action as it will require amending reg regulations and creating alternative pathways to allow for new technologies to be deployed. So uh, with that, I want to turn over uh, to Amy Shank to provide an overview of the study and introduce our speakers. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sean. Um, I want to reiterate uh, thanks to uh, Sheila, Andrew, and Jake for helping us set this up. As always, to the National Petroleum Council for their their help and figuring out how to help us herd all the cats that pulled this study together over a two-year time period. And also to all of my um, uh, partners on the study, um, really the leadership was the easy part. It was down in the trenches where all the work was getting done that was where the rubber meets the road and is really uh, the reason why we ended up with such a great and enduring document. So. Um, I want to walk you through a little bit about how these studies are pulled together and how ours particularly was structured. So um, as, as Sean already alluded to, these with every new administration or really as uh, events dictate, the, the Secretary of Energy can request a study from the National Petroleum Council with the National Petroleum Council existing for the sole purpose of pulling together um, pertinent uh, stakeholders and subject matter experts and, and industry participants to weigh in and provide their their guidance and, and expertise to these studies. Um, so uh, Secretary Perry made this request 
Um, Alan Armstrong, who is the CEO of Williams, uh, was designated as the chairman and uh, deputy secretary at that time, Dan Briette, uh, was his co-chair. These studies are conducted with a uh, partnership from the DOE at every level of the study. And uh, to be honest, um, every meeting included DOE participation, mainly to make sure that we had all of the resources available and um, often reminded us to to stay within the, the four corners of the request from the secretary. Um, the, the questions, including this one, that get asked by the Secretary of Energy um, tend to be uh, simply stated, but the answers are very complex. So in order to, to get us to where we were able to make really meaningful uh, recommendations based on the findings, um, Alan and, and Deputy Secretary Biet pulled together a steering committee made up of um, industry leaders uh, that are also NPC members, as well as we have Representative Christy Craddock from the Texas Railroad Commission really representing um, state regulatory agencies. And um, then we had Richard Newell, who is the head of resources for the future, really helping to represent some of the NGOs and financial um, analyst groups. And so then each of those individuals named um, somebody to be on what's called the coordinating subcommittee, which is really where all the work begins. Um, we did meet periodically with the steering committee. We provided them updates. We brought uh, specific challenges back to them and um, had them weigh in and provide us direction. So um, at the coordinating subcommittee level, um, you can see the leadership um, is, is myself and Sean, uh, as well as Kristen Drew from Williams, uh, Christopher Freitas from the DOE backed up Sean, and um, there's a list that includes all of the other coordinating subcommittee members, which was over uh, 50 individuals, and then Jim Sleutes from the NPC acted as our secretary. Our study was broken down into four chapters, um, and really, so there were four task groups that uh, managed the development of all of that work, and then multiple subgroups underneath each of the chapters. So uh, supply and demand, infrastructure resiliency, mapping and analysis, permitting, siting, and social license to operate, that was the easy one and technology advancements and deployments, which is um, later today, you're gonna hear if you stay on more detail about the technology advancements and deployment chapter. So next slide, please. So what makes this uh, really unique and different from any other um, government uh, sponsored study is the makeup. And Sean already alluded to the fact that there was um, many non-industry participants on the study, but I don't know that it came across that actually over 50% of the participants in the study were non-industry representatives. And so uh, going in, uh, one of the, the requests I made was for people to be willing to get uncomfortable. And um, one of my mantras that I repeated throughout the process was, um, we'll know that we're in the right place when everybody is a little bit uncomfortable because many of the things that we talked about, including the dual challenge, of providing affordable energy while also um, taking into consideration climate change was going to be something that we were not going to be able to avoid and would actually take center stage in our, in our discussions. So next slide, please. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Paul McNutt from Conoco who led our, um, our supply and demand uh, task group. And that's really where the story begins. Thanks, Amy, and, and thanks to USEA for giving us this opportunity to present the study. Uh, I've read through the mission of USEA and, and love the work and love the focus of the organization. So thanks again for having us. Uh, you know, we've got the supply and demand section. And as Sean said, we uh, uh, didn't talk about COVID, didn't talk about a global pandemic and what that would do to demand. 
so I've got seven minutes. I'll, I, if he can't be right, at least be brief, right? So we'll cover these slides and we'll clear them and, and talk through the dynamics that push supply and demand around. And these are the factors that shape that production. And uh, you can see access to capital, access to the resource base. My day job at ConocoPhillips is to track our resource base and the reserves and reserve compliance. Uh, so I'm very close to that part of the business. The cost and resource prices really drive it too. I mean, there is nothing that will suppress demand like high prices and nothing that will grow demand like low prices. And so even as we go through this period of reduced demand, we're probably planting the seeds of that rebound that oil and gas will play a big part of, as Sean said. Uh, so in fact, today I saw in the headlines that um, uh, jet fuel is starting to be used as marine bunker fuel. And that was just inconceivable a year ago that we would put that product in the marine bunkers. Market access, we talked about that and USDA has a, a lot to do with that. Government policy and technology all play a role. And I'll leave the technology piece till later uh, as Doug will cover a lot of that. Next slide, please. So here's our uh, collection of, and you call them forecast scenarios, uh, predictions, projections, and uh, any other word you want to use, because it's a mixed bag of different things. But you see oil on the left and gas, natural gas on the right. And you see this range of outcomes. And boy, you look at that, and, and your eyes probably immediately drawn on the oil to the low end case, which was IH market autonomy case. The name of that case was autonomy. And it was a case where the world kind of, you know, wasn't doing a lot of global trading, became more regionalized. And while the reason for that wasn't COVID, you can imagine that it mimics some of the kinds of things that would happen in a COVID related world. There's not as much global travel, there's not as much global trade, you know, so we are kind of, you know, on the lower end of that envelope. And on the natural gas side, U.S. natural gas was rising in almost all cases as demand kept growing. And the low prices, low costs that we've seen for natural gas and it, the fact that it's low carbon making an ideal fuel going forward in the future. Go ahead to the next slide, please. Geographic shift in production. This has happened over time in the U.S. and around the world that we have produced oil and gas from different places. And again, oil on the left, natural gas on the right. And you can see the rapid growth in the Bakken from almost nothing to over a million barrels a day. The denver Julesburg Basin, which is the home of the Nibrera play near uh, Denver, Colorado. The Permian Basin, a big um, producing basin for over 100 years now, and yet it has this huge resurgence and it has a lot of running room to go. Eagleford, a brand new area, over a million barrels a day. And the Gulf of Mexico, no slouch coming in now, over 2 million barrels a day as it increased production. And on the natural gas side, the big story is Appalachia, as we're probably all aware, now making up almost a quarter of the natural gas, quarter to a third of the natural gas supply in the U.S., causing a complete reversal expansion of the uh, natural gas infrastructure, uh, which Williams has played a big part in and others. And it's just a, a great story. I grew up in Western Pennsylvania, went to Penn State, and the, I won't say the whole time I was there, but I just thought, man, if you could discover a huge gas reservoir in the Northeast, wouldn't that be the best thing in the world? And in fact, it really is from a, again, low cost energy standpoint. Let's go to the next slide, please. So this was the shifting of flows that we talked about, both again, oil left, natural gas on the right. And a lot of this story is middle America. It is, you know, in between the Rocky Mountains and the Appalachians. And that's just a, a factor of the, the geology and geography of it. Uh, so again, the heartland of the U.S. is really going to be the energy driver for the U.S. The markets are on the east and the west coast, and the Gulf Coast is the big heart of the refining industry and now import export markets. You know, so the map, the energy map of the U.S. has changed and grown dramatically. Go ahead to the next one, please. Here's natural gas liquids as they follow, but what a story here where we're under 2 million barrels a day and then, you know, more than doubled that. That's a lot of propane to burn in a, your natural gas grill in the backyard, you know, to, that's a lot of hamburgers and hot dogs. So what are we doing? We're exporting a lot of it and the world market can use it. Go ahead to the next one, please. So here's refined products demand, and we're kind of shifting from supply to demand here. And the liquids consumption outlooks uh, flat to kind of declining over time. And uh, you can uh, 
see it in the in the daily headlines as refineries are starting to convert over uh, to other things or scale back or shut down. Um, in fact, uh, my brother-in-law works at the one in Gallup that Marathon is shutting down, so that, that hits very close to home. Uh, but you see this happening over time, and the liquids demand is coming down as EV penetration comes up, as things get more efficient. And let's go to the next one, and we'll talk about, uh, I think it's natural. Well, here's the carbon constraint scenario. So this is from IEA, and just to clear the slide first, you're seeing quadrillion British thermal units or quads on the y-axis. You see the 2018 snapshot building up from the bottom. It's oil, then natural gas, coal, and nuclear, hydro, all the way up to wind and solar. And if you look at the 2040 EIA reference case, it kind of looks about the same, right? So not a lot of change. And then you go to the new policy scenario, that's the third bar, NPS, is new policy scenario. And then the final bar, SDS, sustainable development scenario. And those do change radically from a oil standpoint, natural gas, you see the renewables rising up there. Uh, but still, oil and gas play a very vital role in 2040. And as this energy mix changes, the infrastructure to deliver it will change as well, both on the oil and gas side, and then you can imagine on the power side what that's going to do. And that may be one of the barriers to complete conversion is making sure that that infrastructure gets in. Go ahead to the next slide, please. Demand for exports, this is not, it's a U.S. story in a lot of ways because our production uh, drove us to be the number one producer of oil and gas in the world. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, Sheila, that we started exporting, and it's a, a good story there. A lot of that happens to be concentrated around the Gulf Coast with some on the East Coast and a little bit on the West Coast, potentially. Uh, but as we meet not just U.S. demand, but global demand, we become intricately linked with the global market. And one of the indications we had of that, we had some great people from Delta on our task group. And they plotted out jet fuel demand over time. And if you look at figure, I'm going to, this is the teaser to get into the chapter, but figure 143 uh, in the supply demand chapter uh, is annotated with, with dips in jet fuel supply and demand. And one of those dips was caused by SARS. In the early 2000s, as it broke out, it was basically a regionally contained epidemic. Uh, but what we saw was a drop in jet fuel demand, specifically in Pad 5, which is the West Coast. So there's an indication of the more connected you are to the world, the more things can ripple through the supply chain and cause these dislocations in supply and demand. Next slide, please. So with that, I'll turn it over to Brooke and she'll take off with the value of infrastructure. Thanks. All right, thanks, Paul. Um, so my name again is Brooke Harris. I work for ExxonMobil in our LNG business and I had the pleasure of co-chairing the infrastructure mapping and resiliency chapter in dynamic delivery. So as we just heard, the domestic transportation infrastructure ably responded to the shale revolution and even enabling it in some cases. And this brings us to our next key finding that the benefits of the increase in oil and natural gas production could not have come about without the significant expansion and adaptation of transportation infrastructure capacity that we've seen over the last 10 to 15 years. The study focuses on five key areas listed on the left of this slide in which infrastructure has led to value and benefits to the country. And those are economic growth, job creation, increased exports, as Paul just alluded to, improved competitiveness of domestic manufacturing, and finally, savings in the form of lower energy prices to households and businesses. Good, move to the next slide, please. The infrastructure chapter outlines in great detail how pipelines, as well as marine, rail, and trucks um, have adapted to enable the American energy renaissance over the last 10 to 15 years. Dynamic delivery also pinpoints emerging constraints that should be addressed to continue to connect new and growing supply and demand centers. The three critical bottlenecks that the study identified include, as listed on the left hand of the slide, are natural gas pipeline access in New England and New York, Port of Houston capacity, and oil and natural gas export capacity. 
And as many of you know, the ability to produce crude oil is frequently dependent on the ability to take away any associated natural gas and NGLs that come alongside that produced crude oil. Permian Basin takeaway capacity for oil, gas, and NGLs has occasionally been constrained, leading to situations in which producers have deferred drilling until new capacity is built. The lack of natural gas takeaway capacity has led, led to increased flaring in 2019, and waivers have allowed for temporary flaring, but this may not be possible in the long term. Finally, at the bottom of this slide, you will note the key requirements going forward in, or, in order to enable U.S. liquid liquids exports and LNG exports that Paul just uh, spoke to. Okay, next slide. So, in addition to the physical infrastructure constraints, the study also identifies a growing concern with respect to labor shortages. As this key, next key finding describes, it's become increasingly challenging to keep pace with the hiring and also developing a well-qualified workforce to build and maintain existing and future infrastructure. This skilled labor shortage will continue to grow as the current workforce continues to retire. Addressing labor shortages and a lack of specialized skill sets will be necessary to support future infrastructure development. And please advance. This next slide summarizes, summarizes the study's key recommendations related to infrastructure development. First, on the left, to maximize the value of infrastructure, all levels of government should have a constructive dialogue about the overall benefits of the nation's energy resources, engage stakeholders, and minimize local impacts and risks. Second, we need to proactively address the constraints I mentioned earlier. Congress should fully appropriate the revenue coming into the harbor and waterways trust funds to restore and fully maintain our ports and waterways um, to their authorized dimensions. Similarly, Congress should authorize the widening and or deepening of our channels to increase the capacity of ports to safely and efficiently transport energy cargoes. Finally, to ensure our workforce is ready and able to build the necessary infrastructure, all stakeholders should promote vocational career education as well as technical training. Similarly, industry along with secondary and technical schools should support registered and accredited apprenticeship programs to ensure an adequate supply of skilled workers. All right, thanks. And yeah, the next slide, please. Finally, the infrastructure chapter cites a number of examples highlighting the resiliency of the nation's transportation infrastructure network. Dynamic Delivery found that an interdependent infrastructure system of pipelines, truck, rail, and marine transport working together with storage ensures the delivery of reliable, affordable energy. This key finding is demonstrated with the graphic on this slide which illustrates the various supply chains that were studied in, in, the, in dynamic delivery. Resiliency calls on multiple modes of transportation, ample storage both at the demand and the supply centers, as well as multiple routes for moving cargoes. But as resilient as the nation's oil and gas transportation system have been, Continued growth and adaptation of that infrastructure faces significant challenges uh, in the permitting and siting process. And with that, I'll turn it over to Maria Dunn to elaborate on those challenges and the path forward. Next slide, please. Thank you, Brooke. Thank you everyone for being here today. I'm grateful for your time. On behalf of Mark Jebby of Williams Company, my co-chair and I, we appreciate that. Um, I, I may get some requests if the, the feeding gets choppy to turn off my video. So I will uh, just, I want you to be able to hear this. So I'm going to probably do that right for right now. For the infrastructure that Brooke has described and that Paul has described in terms of moving product around the country and around the world, permits are needed. This is a highly regulated industry. This image here, and it can be found in the study, is very difficult to read. And when we were analyzing the permitting process at the federal and the state levels, and sometimes even local levels, for pipeline, marine, rail, and truck, 
we came across this associated general contractors depiction. So this is not even industry's depiction of it. This is the contractors that are involved in it for permitting processes for a pipeline project. It is complex. There are many loopbacks on itself. It is, there are many consultations with many agencies. There may be do-overs, there may be duplication. And so one of the findings that the study found was that the overlapping and duplicative requirements, as well as inconsistencies of some regulatory requirements of federal or state agencies unnecessarily lengthen the permitting process. One of the points it, which I think is important to emphasize is that the study does not recommend any repeal or reduction of environmental standards or regulations, but rather there are some practical suggestions to improve the permitting process, improve constructive dialogue as we've heard across agencies and with stakeholders and uh, project proponents to both grow the infrastructure that the nation needs, as well as maintain all of the existing infrastructure that the, the nation is, is so fortunate to have. Next slide, please. Interagency coordination is really important. And at the federal level, we're seeing now with the um, CEQ guidance that there is a recommendation to um, basically further the one federal decision at the, at the federal level that came out a couple of years ago that the study found was, was helpful in enhancing the coordination, minimizing duplication, and at the federal level, um, having a more efficient project that is streamlined. There are, there are some projects that are solely regulated on the left side by the state and local organizations, but in many, if, there are, if there's a pipeline project, the federal state nexus, oftentimes we're dealing with overlapping jurisdictions. And so there were several recommendations. At the state level, uh, we wanted to encourage the state, and, and the study also is fully supportive of federalism, so we want to be clear on that, but we're seeking ways to improve the permitting process. We encourage the state environmental reviews to be done concurrently with the federal decisions. And there are organizations such as the IOGCC or the Environmental Council of States that propose model environmental regulations. The study encourages those organizations to come up with a, a uniform state model for permitting of needed infrastructure and infrastructure projects. And the other thing we found is there are some states that today, Alaska, for example, has a single point of contact for permit coordination that in the experience of the NPC members is effective in helping shepherd permits timely throughout the process. Um, <clears throat> we need to find a way for the state and federal governments to uh, interact better with each other and, and have less polarity and better relationships to, to get the, the overlapping interests and needs of permitting done. Uh, we need to make sure that the NEPA analyses with the lead agency at the federal government that does those coordinate early and often with the state agencies that are also going to be involved. Um, and as I've said, we think that the things such as the FAST Act and one federal decision are, are good steps toward efficient federal permitting and that they should be um, codified and not subject from one executive order change to another. We find that there are, at the federal level, there were some recommendations that would help the permitting there to have concurrent versus consecutive reviews, particularly with LNG storage facilities that are, are highly regulated and have lots of layers and checks and balances and controls there. If there is a dispute, and there sometimes are in the regulatory statutes different standards that agencies um, look at and have to provide, and that is a congressional issue, but we want to find a way for effective resolution of that so that the project isn't necessarily uh, delayed because of dispute between agencies. And then we also think that to have a, a permitting timetable um, with specific points of the NEPA process would be an improvement to the permitting process. Next slide, please. 
Another unique aspect of this study, Amy talked about the variety and the breadth of the membership, was also the stakeholder engagement that we did because all of the processes to comply with whether they are federal, state, or local have a public notice and comment. And the study is very supportive of that. We undertook ourselves listening sessions with various stakeholder groups, three or four of those where we either in person or telephonically um, asked people what their understanding was, what their concerns were with various modes of infrastructure and took that into account. And there's a, a detailed section in the study on the concerns of various stakeholders. They could be right of way members, they could be community members, they may be local um, government officials. But, but clearly we find that to have these projects successfully cited, permitted, constructed and operated early and effective and continuous stakeholder engagement and collaboration is needed. I won't list for you the stakeholder concerns. There are sections in the, in the study and in, in the permitting and stakeholder engagement chapter that discuss all of these, but, but we realize that as you think of where some of the um, de demand, the supply is arising, there may not have been oil and gas production there in many years, if ever. And so education to the community members of the, the permitting, the controls, the technology, the safety concern, environmental concern of the industry and of the operations, education to community members is really important because we may be dealing with the next generation or the subsequent, subsequent one to, um, to, to educate the community members. Um, we want to make sure that the project developers are working with the agencies to have effective engagement and make sure that we're meeting people in the communication style and mode and sometimes even language that is effective to them. So that was one of the recommendations here. Next slide, please. We ended up finding as we listened to folks and also just had our practice, our own life experiences that we shared and, and literature research searches that in permitting of infrastructure, climate change was a concern that arose. And so there's a finding that, and Amy mentioned it, that this nation is facing the dual challenge of providing affordable energy to support economic growth and human prosperity while at the same time addressing environmental effects, including the effects of climate change. The industry and the participants in this study share the public concerns that climate change needs to be addressed. And what we realized is oftentimes litigation is being used as a proxy to address climate concerns, and that is an ineffective approach. And so what we saw, and some of it was regional, but we have a list in the chapter as well of many infrastructure projects, I think it was over 45, that have been delayed or challenged or stopped because of litigation. And the, the NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act, is often the basis, and, and the data we studied showed that it is the most frequent basis for litigation challenging agencies' decision on energy infrastructure. Um, and that can unnecessarily lead to delay. The NEPA was established in the early 1970s and its application and, and the, its growth and the growth of the environmental statutes at the federal and state level around it, um, we think call for enduring change. The CEQ guidance is great and we're pleased to see that being finalized, but the most effective change would be congressional action to be able to have enduring change for the NEPA process. Again, not trying to eliminate environmental protections or controls, but to streamline them. Next slide, please. In addition to the regulatory requirements, the study members recognize that the performance of all of the member companies is critical. And further to the topic of climate change, the study recommends that industry members not only should strive for outstanding environmental performance and reduction of greenhouse gases, but should really look at joining one of these, particularly on the methane side, partnerships that has as their stated goals to reduce methane and uh, leakages. And that we also look, we want the government, particularly Congress, which would be the most enduring change, to clarify under the National Environmental Protection Act that oil and gas infrastructure 
the scope of the greenhouse gas review is the emissions that are approximately caused by the action and reasonably foreseeable. And we want Congress to look at a national policy that has the attributes of being economy-wide, applicable to all sources of greenhouse gas emissions, maintaining market base, being transparent, predictable, not picking technology winners or losers, and keeping the United States internationally competitive. I believe that's the last of my slides. And with that, on the technology aspect, I will turn this over to my colleagues, Jay Church and Doug Sauer. Thank you for your time. Okay. Good morning, everyone. I'm pleased to be here. My name is Doug Sauer. I'm with Phillips 66, and I co-chaired the technology advancements chapter of this study, along with Jay Churchill, who's with me this morning. Uh, I first want to talk about safety of oil and natural gas transportation infrastructure, and then I'll move through some panels for each of these modes of transportation. So we really had an excellent team of individuals that contributed to the technology uh, advancements chapter of the study, and this team verified really what we already knew, and that is that oil and gas uh, uh, moves through its infrastructure with a high degree of safety, reliability, and environmental performance nearly 100% of the time. Uh, but incidents have happened, and the oil and ga gas infrastructure committees, com excuse me, uh, companies are dedicated to continuous improvement and are uh, working to find a path to zero accidents. The graph on the left-hand side uh, demonstrates that each of these modes of transportation, be it truck, rail, pipeline, and marine, deliver hydrocarbon liquids very safely. It also highlights, though, that there's room for improvement. And on the right-hand side, this is according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, oil and natural gas industry provides some of the safest workplaces compared to all other private industries and much safer than the private industry average. So the way we approached uh, our study is we identified the leading causes of accidents in each of these modes of transportation and then we focused our advancement recommendations uh, that address those specific causes. So in the next few slides, um, I'll provide some more detailed overviews of our recommendations on technology advancements and on cybersecurity. So next slide. So for pipeline technologies, this is the first mode of transportation I'd like to cover. Our team made a number of recommendations, uh, and I'll mention three of those. First one's around safety management systems. So pipeline companies should continue to strengthen their safety management systems to drive ongoing safety performance improvements. Secondly, Industry, along with DOE, should pursue additional research and development uh, that can improve pipeline inspection technology, specifically to identify cracks that have been more challenging and to improve remote sensing technologies uh, to uh, allow better detection of emissions and uh, geological changes, for example, that can pose threats to infrastructure. And the third one's around methane emissions. So as, as you know, methane emissions have gained quite a bit of attention as part of the climate concerns. Uh, an interesting data point, though, as it relates to uh, oil and gas transportation is that natural gas demand since 1990 has increased more than 40%, and in that same time frame, transmission pipeline and storage sectors have actually reduced their methane emissions by 43%. Uh, with that said, NPC does recommend additional research and development to pursue innovative technologies that can lower these emissions even further. Let's go to the next slide now. We'll talk about storage uh, technologies. So the underground storage of natural gas is really a critical component of the natural gas supply system in the United States. And we have a recommendation for DOE to lead a collaborative effort uh, with PHMSA and with industry operators to really pursue additional research and development on improving the cavern well design and, and in the inspection technologies for well casing and cement integrity. Uh, let's move to the next slide. So now let's talk about LNG. LNG, uh, the industry has really advanced significantly since its inception in both safety and in technologies. So our recommendations on the LNG front uh, really include updating the DOT regulations to recognize the latest design codes that are being used today for LNG production and uh, export facilities, as well as recognizing 
risk-based standards that are used globally for LNG projects. And without these changes, I think it could impair, our team felt like it could impair the uh, cost competitiveness for U.S. LNG operators uh, in the global marketplace. Okay, next slide. Let's move to, to uh, marine transportation. The marine industry is, has really been a leader in advancing safety and environmental performance, particularly since 1990, and that's when the Oil Pollution Act uh, took effect and after they've implemented actions uh, associated with that, uh, and also from their commitment to improving their safety management systems. When it comes to additional spill prevention in the marine industry, our team identified that additional advancements in the use of navigation technologies, along with training systems, uh, can really offer the best opportunities to prevent marine vessel accidents in and around the ports. That's where the congested areas are occurring. Um, next slide. For the rail sector, uh, I first want to mention that the Federal Railroad Administration safety statistics do show that the rail industry's commitment to safety has been impressive. For example, there's been a 37% decrease in train accidents since 2000. The rail industry has implemented uh, new standards, new technologies to address the causes of those accidents, and they really fit into three categories. First one is rail track integrity, second one is uh, equipment control systems, and third one is around human factors associated with actually operating the trains. And by implementing those improvements uh, should lead the industry to better safety performance uh, even further in the future. Okay, let's go to the next slide. I know I'm kind of flying at a high level here, but I want to get through all of the modes of transportation in the time allotment I have. When it comes to trucking technologies, so we're probably all familiar with the safety technologies on newer cars these days, newer vehicles, including backup cameras, uh, blind spot warnings, even automated braking assist uh, that we see on some of the newer cars. And deploying these same types of, tech, of collision avoidance technologies for the commercial trucking industry there, it's really a prime opportunity to reduce serious trucking accidents. Uh, the commercial industry has been installing technologies. That's underway. And it has been proving to uh, help reduce accidents. Um, there are a number of challenges, though, with deploying these technologies throughout the industry. And, uh, for example, it's more cost effective to install this technology on new vehicles uh, during manufacturing than it is on retrofitting existing trucks. And it also take a long time to turn over the fleet that, of existing trucks. So as you can uh, you foresee, it, it may take quite a bit of time to de really deploy all of these technologies throughout the, the current fleet. So we have some recommendations relating to that. Um, to incentivize faster technology deployment, uh, we're asking DOT to consider sponsoring incentive mechanisms for the commercial industry, as well, along with the equipment manufacturers. <clears throat> to accelerate deploying these safety technologies. And then all, the second one's around the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration and other appropriate federal agencies to uh, support additional research on another technology arena, and that has to do with driver fatigue. There are technologies being developed to detect uh, driver fatigue, and, and we're encouraging them to advance that technology as well. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So this really talks about um, technology development across, you know, all sectors or and all modes of transportation. You know, the technology development is occurring, uh, and it's been an important contributor to helping improve safety and environmental performance. Uh, our team looked at how do we get how do we get better at that? How do we accelerate that technology advancements to drive even even a further safety improvements? So, for example, some of the challenges that the companies face when it comes to research development and even adopting new technologies, you know, it's, it can be time intensive, cost intensive, uh, and then there's often a, a question of the level of adequacy of the acceptance testing. And then uh, another area is, is uh, there can be regulatory impediments from prescriptive regulations that may not be very conducive to introduce new technologies. So all of these technologies, though, or excuse me, all of these challenges we feel like can be overcome 
with the proper level of collaboration uh, among government and industry organizations and from a regulatory framework that really promotes uh, performance-based uh, standards and, and, and use of advanced technologies. So we have a few recommendations on this, and, and that is uh, we recommend, the MPC study recommends that DOE, excuse me, DOT leads an effort with input from industry to create really a, a clear, agile pathway for regulatory acceptance of new technologies. Secondly, we recommend that Congress authorize DOT to be able to establish pilot testing programs that can encourage the industry to do more field testing of new technologies to really prove out their capability in a way that treats those, those field tests as trial runs and not in a punitive way. And then lastly, uh, to increase the level of investment that's occurring, uh, again, to, be, uh, to, to also be able to enable um, an accelerated pace of technology deployment, we uh, are asking FERC and the regulatory agencies to work together with DOT and DOE uh, really to promote an environment that supports cost sharing and investment recovery for pipeline safety related and environmental related research and development. Okay. And the last area I wanted to talk about is cybersecurity. So our team addressed uh, cybersecurity for critical in energy transportation infrastructure. And one of the things we heard consistently is that cyber threats to energy infrastructure control systems is increasing. And the security protections are being challenged. Why? Due to increasing connectivity and also there's a growing malicious cyber threat activity that exists. Um, this growth of internet enabled systems really has enabled data access to in helping uh, companies improve their performance and make more informed decisions really across all industries and that's been a good thing. However, along with that uh, connectivity, it creates some challenges. Connectivity between the, the information technology networks and the operating technology uh, control systems can provide a pathway for cyber threats to enter and without the right level of protections. So last slide on cyber, and this really is my last slide of, of my presentation. We have a few recommendations specifically to, uh, to address these increased cyber threats to energy infrastructure. Um, one is that industry in collaboration with its trade associations and along with government agencies uh, should maintain up-to-date performance-based uh, cybersecurity management standards and, and keep those evergreen. It's a, it's a fast-moving, dynamic uh, kind of environment when it comes to cybersecurity, so it's really essential to maintain up-to-date standards. Secondly, we asked the Department of Homeland Security along with DOE to increase their capabilities and, and resources to help do confidential cybersecurity assessments that's really prioritized on the critical infrastructure first. And then the third area is around uh, information sharing. So Department of Homeland Security, working with DOE and other federal agencies and industry should um, continue, I know there's continued uh, participation in this, but, but should continue to to assist the uh, ISACs, which is Information Sharing and Analysis Centers, to promote more information sharing, specifically around the threats that, that we're seeing and any key learnings from those cybersecurity investigations. And really, that's a summary of the technology and cyber uh, chapter. And if you know, we have a lot of additional recommendations that, that I wasn't able to cover. If you're interested in seeing those findings and recommendations, I would ask you to take a look at the full report that's on the NPC website. And with that said, I think I'll hand it back to Sean, who's going to moderate the panel. Uh, thank you very much. This is uh, Andrew Palmatier with USDA. So I just want to say, first of all, thanks to Paul and Brooke and Maria and Doug uh, for that uh, fantastic uh, overview of, of the two study findings. Um, we, we now want to open up to some Q&A from the audience, so as I um, mentioned uh, before, if you just please would uh, 
submit any questions you might have either through the chat or the Q&A function on uh, WebEx, we'll be happy to uh, pose those questions to the panelists. All righty. Well, uh, thank you, Andrew, and, and, and thanks, Dean. That was a really great presentation. Really, as we kind of just heard from our, our study leaders, you know, the key theme of the study is the important role that technology advances and, and deployment have played in, in improving safety, environment, resiliency, and operational performance of the oil and gas industry. So really, to, to deep deeper into this topic, I'm, I'm really pleased to introduce the, the following panelists for a discussion on technology. And um, we have uh, Jay Churchill, uh, Senior Vice President of Phillips 66, uh, Doug Sauer, Midstream Services Manager for Phillips 66, uh, Drew Pierce, Deputy Administrator uh, for PHMSA, uh, Department of Transportation, and uh, Zach uh, McGavitt from, uh, he's Operation Manager for, for Kirby Inland Marine. So, you know, really uh, to open it up and uh, kind of carry on the, the, the theme, which is uh, uh, Life right now, um, you know, like like many other sectors, um, the oil and gas industry has really been significantly impacted uh, by the COVID nineteen pandemic. And and Jay, I'd like to ask you the question: um, How do you think this will affect how the industry makes technology R and D investments, uh, investment decisions moving forward? Hey, thanks, Sean. I assume everybody can hear me well. Certainly, the industry is uh, strained right now due to the COVID-19. We're all strained. I think all of us uh, feel that. However, there's one thing that we never lose sight of, and that's the importance to manage our safety and environmental performance and to continuously improve. And for our industry, that's embedded in who we are. So this improvement around operational excellence, safety, is a value that doesn't really determine on what's going on outside. That said, I do think companies uh, may adjust their risk uh, returns um, that, um, that they're willing to accept during this downturn. But long term, I firmly believe that uh, the adoption of new technology will be front and center. The other thing that I'd have to say is that the recommendations of this study are even more important today. And that's because the variety of, the, of what we're um, recommending is to reduce the impediments to the adoption of new technology. And those are things from collaboration, working with agencies, working within industry and suppliers, but, but remove the barriers, make it easy to adopt, easier to adopt new technology, bring the cost down, and we'll move forward in this area. Thanks, Jane. And, and really kind of as a follow-up, you know, looking toward the future, you know, beyond the, 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 the current pandemic, you know, what do you really see as the most significant challenges to faster advancement and adoption of, of new technology in the midstream oil and, and gas sector? Yeah, thanks. You know, one of the things that Doug mentioned was, was the regulatory environment. And one of the themes that I was struck by in this study and talking to a bunch of smart people was that how often it came up that regulatory uh, prescriptive requirements that are very well intentioned get in the way of adopting new technology and hinder its, uh, its deployment. So like Doug was talking about, pilot programs. Pilot programs would be key to enabling us to test new technology, get the results, prove the results, ensure that it's effective at uh, mitigating the risk intended, and then it can be adopted very wide scale by uh, industry. The pilot program, as you know, is uh, uh, Congress is working on that to authorize DOT to establish those. I understand the Senate has passed a version of it and it's now in the house. So a little advertisement, uh, we could use 
any and all support to uh, get this uh, passed. The other big thing was around collaboration between the research that the Department of Energy does, FEMSA does, industry does, to prioritize the, the most promising research. We have really good forums uh, set up for that uh, today. We just need to expand upon those, uh, discuss what's most important based upon risk, and we can make advancements. I think an example of that might be the IPIPE consortium that was established in North Dakota to bring uh, you know, government and industry technology providers together to try um, to really try new technology for remote sensing, leak detection, and the management of our infrastructure. And uh, finally, it can't be underestimated with the complexity of our business, the complexity of regulations, a heavy lift would be to create a understandable agile pathway that talks about how we move from really um, the early stages of development through proving out the technology, through deployment, and how the regulations and uh, agencies and, and service providers, how we can really work together to speed that and understand what those requirements are. Yes, and a heavy lift it may be, but I, I, I definitely agree, definitely a necessary lift that, that, that we must make. And, you know, I, I, I do. Um, you know, I, I really appreciate what North Dakota is doing uh, with with some with their R and D program uh, because it, uh, in speaking with the governor there last year uh, and hearing him talk about you know what they've been doing investing in this program, so uh, it is a testament to to what some of the states are really kind of viewing as the prominent issues within their respective state and how to how to make the most of of these opportunities. Um, and really, some of your comments is, it really leads me to uh, you know a question for Drew Pierce uh, with FEMSA. And, um, you know, kind of what in, in what areas um, can government investment in research and development make the most impact, really, you know, and how does the, the industry carry those investments forward towards commercialization and deployment? Thank you. Um, I'm having trouble with my video, which worked earlier, so I'm not sure what's, what's not working. At any rate. Um, there are a lot of areas where R&D can make the most impact. Uh, we want to address both national and also local pipeline safety challenges in both urban and rural communities. Our pipeline safety research program carries out its mission through awards for research that improve the safety of the nation's transportation system, but also protect both people and the environment. We identify research topics uh, on pipeline damage and threat prevention, pipeline leak detection, system improvement, anomaly detection and characterization, underground gas storage, and liquefied natural gas facilities improvements. We work to collaborate with all stakeholders to leverage investment. We engage academia and fund and co-fund critical research. It helps us develop new technology and knowledge. I note that folks have talked about the pilot projects. Uh, I think we'll be discussing that in a later question. Uh, but our R&D program, we recognize that it's the industry that pays for the R&D program. So we do everything that we can to work very closely with industry to decide what needs to be studied. Thank you, Drew. And um, I, I have a follow-up, and, and, and really that, that is about collaboration. And you know, one of the things uh, when I, I came into my role uh, here at the Department of Energy was really focusing on collaboration uh, between industry, government, research organizations, academia, and so forth, um, and, and really uh, really what led us to having a lot of, of field labs uh, for our upstream oil and gas sector was you know, the fact that everybody has to work together to move forward to the greater goal and the greater good. Um, you know, the, the MPC study um, 
the recommendations repeatedly suggest collaboration among industry, government, and, and other research organizations. Uh, Drew, what are some of the, the some of the most effective types of collaboration in, in your experience? Uh, and, and can you share some examples of those? Sure. Well, we hold um, pipeline research development tech forums every two years so that we can meet with stakeholders to analyze and identify where our research or maybe our overlap are, as well as for us to inform stakeholders of our research priorities. We do um, an advanced <clears throat> research plan each year that feeds into a five-year EOP-wide did someone have a question? No. Okay. So we've um, we feed into a larger DOT research plan, and some of the requirements of the plan are set by whomever is the secretary at the time. <clears throat> we work to fit our gaps, overlaps, and our needs into those uh, main goals that come from the office of the secretary. Um, we use report outs uh, at those stakeholder meetings where our two federal advisory committees uh, can learn about our research, upda research updates and also our future research plans. That gives an opportunity for both the public and both the gas and the liquid advisory committees to hear what our plans are and to comment on them and provide guidance for us, guidance and direction. <clears throat> I know that some would say that the I've heard that some say that the FINSA research uh, is kind of a black hole. We do these meetings every two years and then nobody hears from us again. We are working to catch up with our research dollars. And I think after this fiscal year, we will be completely caught up. So you'll see us have an opportunity to be um, faster afoot, if you will, and help work on an annual basis to talk about what our priorities are and talk about our gaps and overlaps. <clears throat> we do have um, a technical team, which includes other federal agencies and ourselves, along with state representatives and pipeline industry groups to assist us in our pre award merit review of all submitted research proposals. That helps us ensure that our program remains focused on addressing the highest safety priorities, and also supports meeting our mandates. Our peer reviews then post-award are also conducted by academia and federal and state agencies to evaluate the progress, the collaboration, the content, and the quality of the research projects themselves. So we work to collaborate. One of the most exciting things we're doing now is developing our own tech center, if you will, at the Transportation Tech Center in Pueblo, Colorado. We hope to be able to both do our own research, but also in the industry uh, with PRCI and others to share uh, the research capabilities um, in that location, which is a great place to do research, has a lot of facilities already in place. We've already begun doing research projects there uh, that are overlaps between the railroad industry and the pipeline industry. And we see this as an opportunity to both do our pilot projects, but also to work ever more closely beside the industry in dealing with the challenging research um, questions that we all have that we can answer. Deputy Assistant Secretary Sean Bennett, this is Ernest Wyatt with USDA. We have a question that has been posed within our chat that I wanted to pose to the floor, if you will. Uh, the question is, what will the impact of higher safety and performance standards discussed for all modes of transportation on customer prices? What will be it? And then the second part to that is, will higher efficiencies offset the cost of these R&D technology programs? Perhaps one of the speakers. <coughs> Such many different sectors and knowledge. Thank you. I, I can take that, Sean. Okay, great. Thanks, Jay. So, as far as the first question goes on cost of the technologies, 
because we're various uh, competitors working together. We did not discuss anything about price or markets or anything like that uh, during this study. Uh, we just talked in general terms about for technology to be adopted, right, there has to be a value proposition there. And certainly reducing spills or leaks or, or increasing the longevity of our assets that are in the ground have a big value proposition, along with our commitment for safety and environmental performance. So that's what really drives uh, the uh, technology piece moving forward is this, this underlying commitment to improve our performance. <clears throat> and I might add that this administration has been working on a number of e-regulatory efforts um, throughout all of the departments of the federal government. <clears throat> but for us in particular, we've been looking at uh, changes in some of our regulations to get rid of some of the old regulations that have been on the books uh, since the 40s uh, and upgrade and actually come into the 21st century with our regulations. We think in a number of cases that those deregulatory efforts will also uh, support uh, cost savings to the industry. It is true that sometimes new technology, there is a cost to new technology, both to developing it and to implementing it. But if it's effective and efficient, and if you can then stop doing what you had to do before so that you can adopt the new technology, then you can see uh, cost savings. That's what we're striving for. No, oh, thank you, Drew. And um, yeah, I, I, I will say, you know, some people believe the, you know, um, some people believe that the actual natural migration of oil and gas molecules in the subsurface uh, naturally migrate faster than the speed of government. And uh, and I definitely believe that uh, we are we are changing that. And um, but you know this is a question for for Doug, uh, Jay, and Drew. You know, the study definitely recognizes that there are regulatory barriers to technology adoption in the midstream oil and natural gas sector, and, and these must be addressed by by federal action. Um, but as it will require amending regulations and, and creating um, alternative pathways to allow for new, new technologies to be deployed. Um, can you describe uh, what mechanisms exist today for this and how the study recommendations would approve upon that? I can start on that. Um, again, this is Doug Sauer. So you asked what mechanisms are in place today. Um, we do have uh, the opportunity to do special applications within the existing regulations. Uh, those certainly have a have a role to play. Uh, what we've been talking about as a study team and as an industry is is the notion of uh, pilot programs, which are different than the the existing available um, special permits. In other words, the special permits are uh, one one user at a time, so to speak, very kind of narrowly defined. Whereas we're envisioning pilot programs. To be set up to where multiple companies can implement that uh, technology in a pilot program environment, and, which can accelerate the learnings, accelerate the field testing, uh, all of which can lead to quicker wide-scale technology adoption. So that's why we think, that's why we're excited about pilot programs, as opposed to the current pace of technology advancement using special permits and other methods. Maybe maybe to add a little bit to what uh, Doug talked about, another area that we discussed quite a bit was industry standards and industry standards evolving and improving for the management of risks uh, within, our, within our industry. And so one of the recommendations is that how can we work together as we develop and progress these uh, standards, that they more quickly get adopted by the regulatory agencies for use. And we've got uh, 
several examples uh, uh, in, of that in the study. I think one of the things you're getting to, Sean, is I think an example is very illustrative of what we're trying to do. If you look at the natural gas transmission, right, the uh, compressor stations and quad OA, it has a very prescriptive requirement that requires packing seal changes to occur on a prescriptive basis of hours and or scheduled time. Well, if you think about that for a minute, you know, what does that do to the incentive for seal providers to improve the quality of the seal design to improve the length of time that a seal operates? On top of that, if you think about every time you have to change a seal, you're into maintenance activities that increase the uh, blowdown emissions from those maintenance activities. And there we firmly believe that there should be an easy performance-based solution of monitoring seal performance that determines the appropriate time to change out the seal and packing pressers. So I can give you one example of the things that we're trying to do in our regs. On the has liquid side, there's a mechanism for operators to notify us if but if they plan to use other technologies for pipeline assessment, the general requirements for consideration are the operator needs to demonstrate the technology can provide an equivalent understanding of the condition of the line pipe, threat being assessed, and submit that to us at least nine months before they conduct the assessment. Previously, we only allowed this provision for pipeline assessments under the integrity, integrity management regulations. Uh, high consequence areas. But recently we expanded that to include non HC assessments as well as through the hazardous liquid rule that we published back on October 1st of last year that was effective this July 1st. It doesn't yet cover new technologies that might be used for purposes besides pipeline assessments, new materials, but those at the moment still have to be addressed through special permits or through state waivers. But we, we do make strides where we can. I recognize that writing regulations is a very slow uh, process, definitely slower than the movement and migration of oil and gas molecules, and so on. Uh, but we do work to deregulate and upgrade those abilities. As I said, too, we are all excited about the um, research development and testing facility that I talked about at the TTC in Pueblo. I believe that's a place where our SMEs can work alongside industry uh, and third party developers and technologies so that there's a comfort level from the beginning, like a pilot project, so that our folks are there on site watching, learning, and feeling comfortable with the new technology as it's being developed and tested. That should make the whole process much more quick. No, thank you, Drew. And, and, and Jay, I'll tell you, I, I can't agree more regarding compressor stations. You know, the the quickest way to remedy, you know, issues with emissions is it's really to incentivize or not create barriers to uh, improving either existing compressor stations or switching up for new ones. And 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 that is something that I definitely agree that that we need to work on. And, I also uh, want to mention, I really like the uh, the set that you and and Doug have. I, I feel like you guys both look like you're on an episode of Crossfire. Uh, <laughs> and I would watch that episode all day long. <laughs> but I, you know, I want to I want to move over to, to, to cybersecurity and you know, cybersecurity. Um, it's just not something that we really paid enough attention to years ago uh, and, and just because you know very it's very mechanical operations that we had in the oil and gas sector but you know it is playing an increasing role and will continue to only be becoming more increasingly important moving forward as we uh, really look towards automation of not just the world not just the oil and gas sector but the, but the, the world in general um, 
know, cyber threats to energy infrastructure control system, uh, they, they are increasing and, and security protections are, are being challenged uh, due to this increasing uh, connectivity and, and really the, you know, malicious cyber activity that's out there. You know, how should these threats be managed as new technology is developed? Yeah, that's, a, that's really a great question, Sean. Our, our industry really does a great job of managing risk. We have lots of risk management programs today that we identify risk, we systematically remove that risk so that we have safe operations. What's unique about cyber is that the risk threat is not static. It's ever changing. And as our installed base of operating controls change, our, our risk exposure changes. I would say that my takeaway in studying cyber with some really smart people was that a holistic uh, management system based approach to managing cybersecurity is extremely important. And if you think about our history in the operating technology side of the house, a lot of our controls were segmented or air-gapped from the outside world. Uh, supervisory controls were just that. They were truly supervisory in nature. And as technology has progressed and as there's been a desire to use digital technologies to improve operating efficiencies, the integration between the IT world and the OT world has been happening where it's getting connected and those interfaces have to be managed. And as we've learned in safety systems and managing risk in safety systems, you have to have a multi-layered approach. It's not just one thing that you do, it's you do all of these things from, from managing the identity of people, controlling who has access, to the segmentation within the systems, to monitoring network traffic, to all of that that needs to be in place. One of my big takeaways in this area was the importance of getting our, I'm going to say our cyber IT professionals working hand in hand with our process control experts. And that needs to happen in all companies, and that is very much promoted by the adoptions of these robust standards. Likewise, in a parallel with, um, I'm going to say, safety, how do we make improvements in safety? We learn from what happens in industry. We have forums to do investigations, share learnings from incidents. Well, that is another recommendation that we applied here in cybersecurity to manage this threat is to get more transparent on the type of incidents that have happened to learn from those and then to review the protections that we have in our cybersecurity management system to um, make sure that it's robust enough to protect from, from those types of incidents. And I must say, even since uh, we issued this report, we're certainly seeing the uh, more rapid sharing of information. And as Doug mentioned, through the ISACs, we're seeing more actionable information here being shared with us that we can um, understand enough to go do something about it. So that's all very encouraging. Oh, thanks, Jane. And really, it's like kind of a Quick follow-up um, to that. Um, you know, the, the study really re recommends R&D efforts on transportation types with the highest risk um, posed by cyber OT threats. Um, really, what do you see as the most vulnerable transportation types, and you know, how do we best prioritize those, those R&D efforts in that area? Well, you know, we had a lot of discussion within our committee about cybersecurity and 
And uh, some of your coworkers were telling me, well, if they told me that, they'd have to kind of do something to me. <laughs> so we stopped short of, of dealing with uh, specific research and development over specific threats and instead took the approach that what we really need is we need our smart people with the appropriate security and clearances getting together and prioritizing uh, the research that would be most beneficial to us. And that's what came out in the recommendation. I can say from the discussions and uh, the incidents that have occurred, obviously the electrical sector is a pretty big target, right? And I think if you go within our industry, you could certainly see the natural gas transmission, you could see even, uh, you know, controls on trucking and all of that being ripe for malfeasance, as I would say. So I, I think it applies to all modes of transportation, um, and we need to really put in protections that are based upon the risk, the various risks that would be posed by an interruption in service due to cyber activity. Well, thank you, Jay. And I, I want to turn it over to the person with probably the best background. Uh, uh, I'm turn it over to Zach with, with Kirby with his uh, tranquil and uh, serene uh, background. It, it's definitely very calming to, to see the shift there. Um, what are the uh, the cybersecurity threats facing the the rail and marine vessel industry, and what security measures uh, need to be taken to to really safeguard against those? Thank you, Sean. So, um, so to kind of expand on some of Jay's comments, it's uh, it, you know, it's really it really comes down to that that analysis between IT and OT uh, as far as the the types of uh, types of equipment, whether it's on board a vessel or on board uh, uh, a rail uh, piece of equipment, because um, it, it, there's definitely a difference today if if that piece of equipment is connected externally or whether it has you know, components that are on board. So I, I think really, I, I guess to answer the direct question, it's threat assessment, and Jay had mentioned that already, is is understanding what the risk is and whether, whether you're trying to protect yourself uh, from a malicious type of intrusion or whether your uh, operational day-to-day uh, safeguards are in place, you know, whether it's routine maintenance and, and you have a, an engine, whether it's on, on, on rail or on marine, uh, a lot of computer components these days in, in those types of pieces of equipment, and they all have software that, that run. They may not be connected externally to the internet uh, to where somebody can maliciously, you know, whether it's domestically or overseas, take control of one of those pieces of equipment, but uh, but, but you could ser you could have some serious uh, repercussions if one of those pieces of equipment failed because of a uh, an oversight in the in the software. So uh, so when it comes to cybersecurity, there's you know Jay Jay kind of spoke to that, but there's uh, there, there's really two aspects of it: the the malicious side and the unintentional consequences of, of lack of oversight. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Zach. And uh, I want to go back to pipelines here. And uh, Doug, I have a question for you here. Um, you know, although the, the pipeline industry and, and coding manufacturers, uh, you know, conduct research to develop more effective, damage-resistant, longer-life coatings, you know, research is, is not really conducted in a manner and level that leads to adoption and commercialization of those new technologies. Um, you know, how can R&D funding from the federal government help drive more efficient commercialization and quicker adoption? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that is an important question because, you know, research and development occurs today. It occurs within or from industry operators, from equipment suppliers, material suppliers, but there's a certain pace at which that technology is invested and, and developed, right? And so I think where government can help is by co-funding uh, some of these investment opportunities, not necessarily in a specific technology, but, but in, a, in, a, in a technology 
area, right, or a, or a problem area that needs a technical solution. And, uh, and not just co-funding, but perhaps funding in the earlier stages of the development where the risk is much higher, right, of, uh, or the certainty of, of getting a return on that investment is much lower, then you're, you see fewer um, of the uh, sort of for-profit companies participating in that space. But so if we can have a sharing around advancing those technologies all the way through the development continuum, I think we can speed the pace of, of technologies to make it to the marketplace. Thank you, Doug. And uh, uh, Drew, um, you know, I, I talked about cyber uh, earlier, but um, you know, the, the other very popular topic these days is really the role of artificial intelligence. Um, you know, what role do you see uh, for artificial intelligence and, and drones to identify pipeline, uh, pipeline leaks and, and, and mitigate methane emissions? Well, you know, drone technology is moving very quickly and it's pretty exciting. We're seeing drones used for subsidence detection, for land movement detection, plus just to alleviate traffic like in the Permian Basin. Um, they have broad applicability to all types of pipelines and facilities to provide innovative methods for us to assess and detect pipelines for leaks. Leak detection methods can range from manual visual detection, either aerial or ground patrols, to more automated systems through computational pipeline monitoring or supervisory control and data acquisition data systems. It is typically more challenging, though, to detect gas leaks, as you all know, particularly the smaller ones, via any automated system, given the compressibility of gas. It can also be difficult to detect and pinpoint leaks reliably, reliably via manual visual methods as the leak can travel, and they can travel a significant distance from the actual source before it reaches the surface. Um, we have funded a number of research projects, primarily through the CAP program, which uh, is our affiliation with universities. Uh, a number of those projects related to various sleep detection aspects of drones. But we need further work, and we would certainly be happy to do even more collaboration with industry on this. They're needed in this area to improve the reliability uh, to detect leaks in challenging real-world real conditions like poor weather and high winds. Artificial intelligence is being incorporated not only through drones, but also through other technologies and methodologies, and they are helping to improve threat detection and also characterization. For leaks and methane emissions specifically, we think AI could help improve characterization of the size or rate of the leak and the associated emissions. For other assessments, we're looking at AI to help improve detection and characterization of different threats in a pipeline such as cracks and pits, an inline pipeline inspection that could lead to additional integrity issues or failures. We see a lot of uses coming for AI and also for drone technology. We are doing research, but a lot more needs to be done, and we look forward to partnering to do it. Well, thank you, Drew. And Zach, I want to go go back to you. And you know, I, I truly believe the uh, you know the unsung hero of our you know our, our dominant position, especially related to international um, uh, or international um, role in, in, in oil and gas is really the marine transportation sector, especially you know with the crude oil exports uh, um, back several years ago, and, and LNG becoming more prevalent here over just the past five years, uh, as well as, you know, what we're able to do with refined products. Um, during your presentation, uh, you mentioned improved navigational technologies as a, as a key uh, technology advancement uh, that would help uh, mitigate vessel accidents. Um, do you see other critical transformational technologies on the horizon for the marine sector? Yeah, I would, uh, I would definitely say that there's there's a lot of new technology on the horizon. Um, I, I think the main discussion right now is is how best to implement that that technology. It, you know, because especially especially in the marine industry, uh, it, you have to have a harmonization between 
putting all this technology on a vessel and training the mariners that that are going to use that technology. So, um, it, so yeah, technology ha has definitely advanced. Uh, it, you know, I think the most groundbreaking uh, uh, piece of technology back in the 1930s when radar uh, was first introduced. Uh, today, that's still probably one of the single most useful. Uh, pieces when it comes to safe navigation, but uh, uh, it, but you know as as you go through the years with electronic charting and it, you know it, a lot of the AIS technologies and and it, you know you can go through every one of the uh, the items we've listed in the report, but uh, but even well beyond that, it, there's there, there's many more down the road coming, but uh, but I think our our discussion needs to be of how we how we train our mariners that are going to use that and not just uh, throw throw too much technology uh, when you you still have the weak link of the human that you have to train on how to effectively use that technology. So there's definitely a, a balance between the two. Oh yeah, yeah, I definitely agree. And um, I kind of uh, also want to ask you another question, um, and this is uh, regarding IMO 2020 and, and really the the new rules on sulfur content of shipping fuels. You know, it was expected to take center stage this year, but with COVID-19 and the impact to oil and gas demand, it, it seems to have taken a little bit of a back seat. Um, can you speak more uh, about the impact of IMO 2020 and and what you expect going forward and the role that technology is expected to play with respect uh, to this in the future? Sure. Uh, so I, I would say, uh, you know, especially prior to, to 2020 and prior to COVID, there, I, I think there was some speculation, you know, in the market that, that supply would, would start to become an issue. Uh, and uh, I, I think even before the, the months where we were really into the, uh, to the COVID downturn, uh, it, it didn't seem that supply w was much of an issue. It, it seems the supply was there. Um, I, I think once COVID took effect, uh, supply is still, well, uh, you know, obviously there's plenty of supply at this point, but uh, uh, it, you know how that relates to technology. I, I don't, uh, I, I don't see many issues in regard to that. You know, with the scrubbers, you know, scrubbers are are, are available, uh, but but I think. I think COVID has kind of you know introduced a new kind of kind of factor to that as with many things in life today where you know the the price difference between the high sulfur and low sulfur fuels has has now shrunk uh, so there's not as much of a, a, an incentive to to need the the technology where the, the barrels uh, the, the barrels are, are cheaper to go with the lower sulfur so and, and I it, back earlier when uh, when Paul was speaking you know he, he did mention how uh, how jet fuel is is being you know, interjected into that stream mainly from lack of use. So, uh, uh, so su I would say supply is definitely not an issue on the technology side. The technology is there with with scrubbers, uh, and and going forward, I, I think it's uh, I think it's purely an economic uh, economic decision. No, thank you, Zach, and um, you know, and thank you all on the panel, uh, Jay, Drew. Uh, Doug and Zach, this is this has been phenomenal. It's very very interesting, and um, I guess I uh, want to ask Jake: uh, Do we have any? Uh, have we had any uh, Q and A? Any questions coming in from the from the group? Uh, we don't have any additional questions. Thank you. All right. No, thank you, Jake. And uh, I think that's a true testament of of how well you all explained um, your respective uh, areas of, and, and and subject matter. Um, you know, really, again, this has been, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, the MPC study, working on this infrastructure study, uh, has been definitely one of the highlights of my life. And I, I think we can all agree, uh, getting in the room, really discussing these issues, uh, and, and, and really finding this consensus has really provided for a, just a, a great report. So, um, you know, I want to turn it over to, to Sheila uh, for closing comments, but... Um, you know, thank you all for, for participating today. Uh, I definitely want to thank every panelist, um, you know, again, not just our panelists here uh, on the technology discussion, but uh, Paul McNutt, uh, Brooke Harris, Maria Dunn, uh, uh, Doug Sauer uh, for their presentations, as, as well as Amy Shank for, for being a, a phenomenal leader of the study. So, uh, Sheila, I will turn it over to you, and, and thank you all very much.
Well, thank you, Sean. And this has been an outstanding, truly remarkable uh, amount of learning that can take place just by listening to this this little webinar. Uh, but reading the report is, uh, I think, extremely important for everybody in the energy business in any capacity. I think you highlighted what some of the uh, what some of the critical issues are, which is uh, reliance by other industries, i.e., let's say electrical. Uh, or let's say uh, uh, waste treatment facilities and the interconnection between and among uh, major infrastructure uh, in the country and the necessity of having a uh, secure, uh, reliable, uh, safe supply uh, of oil and gas. And uh, so in that, in that sense, I think we really have hit on some topics and there's so much more and obviously in the study itself, which is uh, one of the finest studies I've ever read on anything. Uh, it, it is so, there's so much more to study and understand and embrace. Uh, having been uh, in the, the belly of the beast in the, in the trial of many of these uh, types of huge infrastructure cases where you're trying to get an LNG facility built or a gas pipeline built, I can tell you this is really uh, a remarkable um, kind of uh, light out of the forest of the 12 year battles, which end by the, by the time the battle is over, the world has changed and the battle is irrelevant. Uh, and that's the risk of the enormous uh, funding that is necessary to go through the uh, classic uh, post NEPA world uh, type of major oil, gas, interest, and, and others, but let's say oil and gas, LNG uh, facilities. And uh, on behalf of the lawyers of the world, I say in, in some ways it's sad because it will shorten, <laughs> it will simplify and shorten the, uh, the debate and dialogue and make it a little more uh, crisp uh, to, to reach an outcome in something other than 10 years uh, of slugging it out at FERC or elsewhere with uh, 10 different agencies all headed in very different directions with different mandates and uh, different, uh, different pressures. So uh, thank you, thank you uh, to the NPC and the uh, truly scholarly uh, contributions by those who are, have been involved in the study and for our wonderful speakers today. I know uh, Barry must be looking down very, very happy <laughs> to see such a, such a great, great project come to fruition and us having the honor of helping you uh, get the message out. And we look forward to many more opportunities to work with with you, Sean, uh, with DOE, and with the outstanding intellects that have contributed uh, directly and indirectly to this uh, magnificent uh, product. Thank you. Andrew, if you're out there, uh, would you like to close with, by saying anything? Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Sheila. Apologies before we end the meeting here. I'd just like to echo our, our thanks to all of our panelists, uh, to our uh, super moderator, Sean Bennett, as well, for uh, all your contributions. And uh, again, to, to James Lutz from uh, the National Petroleum Council for pulling this all together with us. Um, for those of you uh, who wish to access this after the fact, if you wish to go back and, and uh, re-listen to some of the wonderful comments and insights provided by our panelists, this will be available. Uh, on USDA's website and on our YouTube channel. Uh, and the uh, slide deck that was given today also will be available um, on our website. So um, once again, thank you all very much uh, to the, the panelists. Thank you to our attendees for joining today. Uh, and we look forward to continuing this important discussion in the future. Um, have a wonderful morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. thanks.